The Green Bay Packers have plenty of talent on offense. What they lack is experience and polish. And that's kind of the point of going to a youth movement. But that doesn't mean it's not still a problem right now. Plus, speaking of problems, this run defense has Matt LaFleur suddenly, like the rest of us, feeling some type of way about insanity because that is what has been going on in Green Bay for far too long. Is it going to change? Doesn't seem like it. All of that on today's show. You are Locked On Packers. Your daily Green Bay Packers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. You are Locked On Packers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Peter Bukowski, and I cover the Packers for The Leap, a newsletter I would love for you to subscribe to. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked On Packers. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked On Packers, the number one Packers podcast on the internet. And the show for fans who know what happened, they want to know why and how. Thanks to everyone who makes Locked On Packers their first listen every day. We hope you like starting your day with us as much as we like starting our day with you. Today's episode brought to you by our friends at LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. When the Packers set out on this youth movement, we knew there would be bumps in the proverbial road. And after the Falcons' loss, I pointed out that that was not a game where it was the experience showing. That was the defense. That was Joe Barry. That was J.R. Alexander and Kenny Clark and Quay Walker And these guys, Russell Douglas, these are the guys who are supposed to be the stalwarts of your team, of your organization, frankly. And it was the young guys who lead you back against the Saints. But as I went back and watched the tape and thought about what is actually going on here, what is the problem? Because what I wanted to see was... What you can't see on the broadcast, unless they're they're zoning in on it and actually showing it to you, is were there players open and and Jordan Love was just missing them or or not taking them? JT O'Sullivan, I, I love this phraseology and I'm going to start using it because I think it is more appropriate. I usually call it a miss. Sometimes it's not a miss. It's a turndown. And there are there could be reasons for turndowns. And as as JT often points out, uh you might turn something down because that's what you want to do. That's what the play, or that's what at least you're, you, you, you call a play and you go, okay, this is normally how this is read out, but we want to get to this part of the concept. So I up that number one. And then if you see the linebacker do this, you've got the backside dig, whatever. There are, there are actually circumstances where you would do that. It's not uncommon. And it's not certainly not uncommon for Matt LaFleur who loves to do the play off the play. They want, to, they want to call a play to set something up off it later. But what I saw against the Lions, there were, there were certainly opportunities early in that game, and Matt LaFleur talked about it. You have to, if you're Jordan Love, you just have to take the profit. Just take the play. You got the slant to Romeo Dobbs, throw it. He's open, throw it. There were a couple of those where you he's open on time, in rhythm throw the ball. But then if you look at some of the other plays, the negative plays, the sacks, the interceptions, you go, well, there's an issue here that is not just related to Jordan Love. On the first interception, Christian Watson, they're running strike from a condensed set. It's a play action concept. They have this season run strike from the gun, which I actually like a little bit better because it allows Love to get his eyes on the defense faster. These Lions linebackers didn't bite hard on the run fake. And Jordan Love doesn't know that until he gets his head back around from turning his back to the defense. If he's just handing the ball, he can sort of side-eye 
what's going on with the linebackers, or and he can just pop his head up, and now he's ready to set and fire. He's got to take a second to set anyway. And it's not a whole second, but it's a part of a second, which allows you to figure out, okay, what am I seeing? What's going on? Christian Watson, from a condensed set, he's got to run a burst release. He's got to widen his defender so that he, when he comes back inside, there's room to make that throw. He didn't. And so you, you, you allow the linebacker to get underneath it. Whereas if he runs a burst release outside, now when he breaks in, there's a much bigger window there and you probably can't get that linebacker to affect the throw. On the second interception, Matt LaFleur, who hates Hates to blame players specifically. We'll we'll blame, you know, groups of players. We'll blame tackling or we'll blame, you know, coverage or whatever. But rarely is he going to say this was so-and-so's fault, but was asked, does Rome have to stay with that play? And Matt LaFleur's answer was, yes, you have to stay in the structure of the play unless the quarterback breaks the pocket. And it is the double-edged sword of having a, a quarterback in Jordan Love who can and does extend the play. But you didn't see Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams having those problems. That's a time on task issue. That They just don't have that continuity to know, okay, on this concept, I'm going to come to, because the concept is not, he's running a basic on the backside. It's not really to him. Jordan Love is reading the front side of the concept. It's not there. And so now you got to come back. Not ideal. But you have to stay within the play. Another another situation. Jordan Love, hand signal. Yes. Yes. A hand signal. He gives the hand signal. Not everybody on that side of the, of the concept seems to get the hand signal and you have a miscommunication. Love has to eat a sack. Now, I thought on that play, he could have thrown to Dobbs, but you when, when you're trying to read the concept and someone doesn't do what you expect, that throws everything off. And again, I'm not absolving Jordan Love either. I started this conversation, let's remember, with saying there were a couple turndowns in this game from Love where you just got to throw it. You can't get, Matt LaFleur called it picky. You can't get picky. If it's there on read one on time, it's got to come out. You got to throw it. And I know sometimes game script says we're trying to hunt the big play. By the way, Aaron Rodgers loved, loved to hunt that big play. There are some just in a lot of the ways that Aaron Rodgers learned some things from Favre, we were just like, mm, can you not? Jordan Love has learned some things from Aaron Rodgers where he's learned some great stuff and also some things where you're just like, dude, can you just just take it? Just take it. Just take the check down. Just, just don't try and make the perfect throw. Just try and make a fine play and live to fight another day. Rather than remember early, if you're old enough to remember early Aaron Rodgers, that's now a while ago. One of the big criticisms of his game was he would eat sacks trying to find, <laughs> be cool. He would, he would take these negative plays trying to hunt big plays. And it was like, can you please just throw a check down? That was also a problem in 2018. All he wanted to do was throw it down the field. Never wanted to throw the check down. Just throw the check down. So they have to, they have to build some of that stuff in. Some of that stuff is built in. But this is, this is a detail issue. It's a time on task issue. It's a continuity issue. It's a game time experience issue. The Packers knew this was going to be a problem. They knew that. And so the fact that they're a top 10 by DVOA offense, even with those issues, I think tells you what the talent on this team is, what the upside of this team is. It tells you that Matt LaFleur is a really good coach. And it tells you that Jordan Love has a lot of talent. There are a lot of plays after the first couple drives. Now I know. Other than that, how was the play, Mrs. Lincoln, after the first couple drives? They're down, you know, 24 to 3 or 20, you know, whatever the score was, 27 to 3 at halftime. But you come back in the second half, you start to make a game of it, and the defense can't hold their water, but you start to make a game of it. And even against a team playing a bunch of covered, you know, two high looks, you create some big plays just because 
of arm talent and and skill talent. That against a good defense, that tells you where this team can get to. Can they get there this year? I don't know. I don't know. But I know that they can get to a place that is pretty pretty cool, pretty great. They're just not there now, but they're not there now for reasons that were predictable. Reasons that we could have and and should have foreseen coming into this year. And so I don't think that's something to be worried about at the moment, but it is something to point out. Hey, look, there are some issues. And one of the reasons why they're not consistent, this is the biggest reason why. It's it's not even the, the, the offensive line got whooped on Thursday. Because even with that, if the defense plays a little bit better in the second half, if the offense in the first half, a little bit of detail, Christian Watson runs that burst release, maybe Jordan Love doesn't throw that interception. Jordan Love doesn't turn down an open receiver underneath. Maybe they score seven instead of three and everything is totally different. You never know how these things play out differently if you can find those little details and fix them during a game. So this is fixable, but also you got to fix it. All right, we're going to talk about this defense. Speaking of, you got to fix it. Coming up in just a second here on Locked on Packers. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. I'll give you a great example. You look at my LinkedIn profile. It says I'm a host. If you are hiring for the Cheesecake Factory, you might be looking for a host. It's a different kind of host. And you have to be able to look at my resume or have a filter question and know right away you do not want my resume, I'm not going to send it, but you don't want to waste time looking at it either. That's what LinkedIn can provide. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And thanks for making Locked on Packers your first listen every day. Every dayers. We've got Expert Tuesday tomorrow. We have Zayu Duin on Wednesday, a crossover Thursday with your boy Q from Locked On Raiders, and then an interview coming up on Friday. But it's Monday Night Football, baby. Monday Night Football will be live after the game on Monday night. Matt LaFleur was asked about Joe Barry and the structure of this defense. And he had a number of answers, but I thought... This one stood out to me. He said, I think it can be solved schematically. I really do. We've got good enough players. It's more the philosophy of some of the things we're trying to get done. Different ways, especially when you know teams are going to run the ball. I know we'd like to keep a shell on our defense, but there may be times you have to break that. What is frustrating about it is, and and after the game, he said, you know, look, uh, doing the same thing over and over, insanity, all that stuff. But it was insane after the season. And they kept Joe Barry. And one of the reasons why I we, we went on this show and, and talked about it was because Matt LaFleur has more say in this defense than maybe we realize. And that this is kind of how they want to play. They just think they need to execute better. But there's too many times when they're just outgunned up front. And I don't don't even just mean like talent-wise. Like, yes, they're built to rush the passer. They're built to defend passing games. They are built to play with a lead where other teams are trying to catch up. That's what they are built for defensively. TJ Slayton, I believe, is the only player on the roster on the defensive line over 310. So, like, Kobe Wooden is 275, 280. Carl Brooks is 285. They're pass rushers. They're not guys there to fit the run. There are a ton of times when they're in these two high safety looks and you need Darnell Savage to come up and fill against the run, and he doesn't. Or Rudy Ford doesn't. You need an alley defender. 
They can't run the alley. You have a linebacker that can't get off a block. Like there are personnel flaws here for sure. But then you have a situation like we saw against Detroit where they actually quick gamed. They they tempoed the Packers to keep them in their nickel personnel because they caught them in nickel personnel in the red zone against, I can't remember, I, I think it was 12 personnel. Might've been 21. I think it was 12. And it's like, it's just not going to work. Now you create mismatches when you can line up in 12. This is what the Packers want to be. Line up in, in two tight ends and say, well, now we're going to spread you out and we're and you got to play nickel against us because you're worried about Luke Musgrave. In this case, it's it's the Lions you're worrying about what Sam Laporte is doing. But they're just they're they're matched up in ways that don't make sense. There was a, there was a rep, I can't remember now if it was Atlanta or Detroit. They come up with three tight ends, and the Packers are in nickel. What? That's setting your team up to fail. And there are times when you want to live in that too high world. Okay, but. No one on this Lions team can beat you vertically. So why are you why are you sitting in too high? No one. You're afraid of no you're afraid of play action concepts against Atlanta. But you're afraid of no one on Atlanta beating you over the top. Not really. You're afraid of concepts beating you over the top. But if you do your if you play your responsibilities, you should be okay. Communicate, pass things off. Do what you need to do and you should be okay. Force Desmond Ritter to make some throws. We saw it in the Lions game. I watched it on the on the coach's tape on the first drive. They've got a touchdown to Kyle Pitts. Desmond Ritter misses him I, I can't, it, like by 10 yards. Desmond Ritter stinks. Look at how these other teams are playing Atlanta. Load the box. There were times when Detroit had nine guys in the box against Atlanta. That performance is a damning indictment of Joe Barry. And of course, this defense, but they're not being set up to succeed. And I don't know how many times I can bring up this example of Jim Schwartz and point out they made some additions, Dalvin Tomlinson, Zadarius Smith. The spine of that defense is essentially the same. And they look so much, so much, so much better. And certainly much better than Green Bay does. There are teams out there that do more with less talent than Green Bay has. And I understand there's there's some questions like if you can't do it at a certain point, isn't talent the problem? And yes, there's structurally some problems with this team. But they're they're built mostly for how they want to play because they want to they want to stop the pass first. And they thought that doing some slanting was going to, you know, some stunts, some twists, some games up front was going to help their run defense. No, you just don't have the bodies. You just don't have the bodies. And and that's where we run into another problem here. Rashawn Gary can't just play whatever, 15, 18 snaps. If he's healthy enough to play, he's got to play. This week four now. And I know coming off a short week, some of those questions. Lucas Van Ness, if he's healthy enough to play, he's got to play. Having depth on the outside linebacker spot is really nice. Your two best guys right now are Lucas Van Ness and Rashawn Gary. Those guys have to play. You can't be sitting in there. It's it's goal to go from inside the five and you've got Justin Hollins and Kingsley and Ibarri out there. Those guys are going to get dog walked in the run game. It's in the, you know between the 40s, fine. Any other time, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. So there are structural problems here. There are things uh, that are personnel-wise that are problems here. And, the, and the, you know, one of the bigger problems, it's not a bigger problem, but a, a follow-up problem is where do you go at the end of the season? Let's say they move on from Joe Barry. It doesn't make sense to do it during the season. Like, unless you're just going to call, unless Jim Leonard is just going to show up and coach your defense. There, it doesn't make sense to do it now, I don't think. Maybe you give one of the guys on your staff a chance to make a name for himself. It, I, to me, it's not out of the question, but I don't think it's going to happen. Let's say Jim Leonard doesn't want to do it again. Well, Brandon Staley, same problems. All the same problems. Smart coach, it seems like, but all the same problems stopping the run. Can't do it. 
Robert Sala probably going to get another year. Do you, Vance Joseph's probably going to get fired. Do you want Vance Joseph, the guy that just gave up 28 points and, and a near perfect passer rating aside from the game losing interception to Justin Fields? The guy that gave up 70 points to the Dolphins? That the guy you want? Who is the who is the coach out there that you're like, oh yeah, I want that guy? Well, it was a Giro Evero. If there was ever a game where you want to point to and say, look at how good a Giro Evero is, it was this Broncos game. Because Vance Joseph, working with a lot of the same players this season, they can't get a stop. This was a top 10 defense last year. Now I know... The Panthers blew a lead against the Vikings. Part of that was because Bryce Young fumbled. You get a touchdown and you blow the game that way. That was not a defensive problem. They gave up 14 points against Kirk Cousins and Justin Jefferson who they were scoring successfully on a lot of teams. I would take a Giro Evero as the defensive coordinator in Green Bay right now today. That's not the decision that they made. Who are you going to upgrade to? And that's the fear, I think, if you're a Packer fan about this, is if they do move on from Joe Barry, are we sure that they're going to upgrade? Because that was the question with Mike Pettin. They they went from Mike Pettin to someone else. And I think a lot of us agreed, Mike Pettin, it was probably time. But they didn't upgrade. If anything, right now, it seems like they downgraded. And that is a major, major problem. All right, I want to talk about this offensive line and where they go from here after some of the issues that they had at the line of scrimmage against the Lions and really all season. That's coming up here on Locked on Packers. Snap into action this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. That is, for those unfamiliar Not normally how losing a bet goes. You don't normally get way more (laughs) than you wagered. If you've been looking, if you've been thinking, if you've been considering joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. I'm always just like, pull it up. Let me check things out. Let me see what I can get. Oh, has the line moved? I got Seahawks. Plus one and a half. It's now Seahawks minus one and a half. I feel really good about that. So visit FanDuel.com slash on and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. And thanks for making Locked On Packers your first listen every day. Every day or check out what we're doing over at theleap.football. I have my Monday free newsletter out today. And uh, check out what we're doing over on our subtext. Uh, Locked on Packers is the subtext. The people that we have on there right now are super active. I love that. It's a great community and it is something that I'm looking forward to continuing to do um, for the rest of the season. And then of course, once the offseason hits, um, it's going to be a great, I think, well of content for us too, because we're going to get to answer your questions. It's going to be a great place for you to send me questions. Go check it out. What happens with this offensive line now? Elton Jenkins didn't go on IR. So how much time is he going to miss? Offensive line injuries, knee injuries. These guys can can play through injuries in ways that say a receiver or a running back can't. It's just a different modality. It's a different functionality. There's a lot of biomechanical reasons why offensive linemen, it's just different. That being said, this run game right now is a disaster. It it is it is a shirt show. If this were the good place, that was that's what I would say. It's it's bad. It's really bad. And it, it wasn't very good last year either. And when you think about it that way, you know, it's not it's not altogether surprising that the Packers, for as good as John Runyon Jr. is as a pass protector, and he's an above average pass protector at guard, that they are trying to find ways to improve that spot. But that doesn't make sense then why Royce Newman is out there because he's a bad pass protector and a bad run blocker. And Josh Myers, I don't know what to make of Josh Myers at this point because he'll have some really nice plays, And then he'll just lose his mind 
for a couple of plays. And, and all of that is true. And yet when they were healthy, now they're not going to get David Bakhtiari back at all, but when they were healthy, this, and even with that, for the first three weeks, even with the injuries, we're talking about one of the three or four best offensive lines in the league. So how do you put together your best five? Well, it is time to give Sean Ryan an opportunity. We know, we know Royce Newman is bad. We have seen it. It's on the tape. He was bad in 2021 when he was a starter. He was bad in 2022 when he was given the opportunities to start. He's been bad this year. He is, at this point in his career, a sub-replacement level football player. Just is. So, we, but but there is this uh, lean for a lot of NFL coaches toward known quantities. We know what he is. He has experience. That is true. But that is also antithetical to the approach that this team has taken. It's not about experience. It's about ability. And at this point, I don't know what the case is for his ability. What is his ability other than he can play and Elton Jenkins is hurt. Like availability is the only ability that he currently has. That's, you know, of course, underselling his ability as a football player. He's an NFL player and, and we should never forget that part of it. But that's why I use the phrase sub-replacement level. It's it's bad. It's It's just not good enough. We know that. We don't know if Sean Ryan is good. We don't know if Sean Ryan is bad. But that uncertainty is worth it. I I kind of don't care about practice anymore. Like, I get that if he sucks in practice, you just can't put him out there, Sean Ryan. But you look back at training camp, based on the the play um, that we saw in the preseason, Sean Ryan was better. Based on the, the play script, when you... Royce Newman is playing deep in the fourth quarter. It seemed like Sean Ryan had passed him on the depth chart. And then when there was an opportunity, okay, in game, I get it. You go with the guy who's a veteran, play him in there. But then when you had time to prepare, okay, a short week still, you've got more time to prepare. Why is Sean Ryan not the guy? Now I'm wondering with the mini buy, with time to prepare, you know, Matt LaFleur said, oh, all options are on the table, all that stuff. It's time. And... There is always this pushback in these sorts of moments when you, you you have fans say, well, the coaches know they see him every day in practice. That's true, but the coaches saw Zach Tom every day in practice and decided to start an NFL game with Jake Hansen and Royce Newman. Royce Newman playing out of position at right tackle and Jake Hansen playing out of position at right guard instead of playing Zach Tom, who for the whole preseason and training camp was a better football player. This is the same coaching staff that has made major tactical errors in offensive line lineups in the postseason we, that have been well-documented on this show, have been first guest, second guest, third guest, fourth guest. Like I was ahead of, hey, these are the guys that need to play. They were wrong. Coaches get this wrong. And this is a, a team an organization, a franchise that is as as good as there is in the NFL at developing these offensive linemen. They identify the talent and they develop them, they coach them up. Yash Nyman was not a starting caliber player when he showed up in Green Bay. Rasheed Walker was not a starting caliber player when he showed up in Green Bay. Ellen Jenkins probably was, but David Bakhtiari wasn't. He had to be coached. Now, different coaching staff, but we're talking about the same bones of the scouting staff that identified the talent that could then be coached into the player that becomes an all pro. They identified the ability and then they brought that out of him. Elton Jenkins, Zach Tom, Rasheed Walker. These are really, really good football players. And, you know, Zach Tom did not play well against Detroit, was playing on one leg. John Runyon Jr. got hurt the second drive of the game, had to play the rest of the game, hurt. It's a different game if those guys are healthy. Everyone's dealing with injuries. It's not an excuse, but it is a good reminder. 
it is time to change this lineup. Now, what they do beyond that, I don't, I don't, I don't see moving Josh Myers to guard. In fact, I got uh, the messages on subtext about that. I don't, I don't think that makes sense. He's either a good enough center to play center, or he's not. So he's, it, he's not better than John Running Jr. Flat out. And I have advocated, hey, when Alan Jenkins is healthy, let's say JRJ at center. There's a reason Sean Ryan was getting center reps. They did not believe that Josh Myers was for sure their guy. They gave other guys every opportunity to come say, I'll take this job. No, they didn't, but they gave them every opportunity to do that. Last year, they showed a willingness at a certain point to make wholesale changes. Elton Jenkins, back to left guard. John Renin Jr., flip sides, and just rejigger the whole thing. And they made it work. And the second half of the season, they were excellent. They were excellent until the final game of the season and Josh Nyman basically got played off the field by Zach Tom, who's now your starter. So they're willing to make some of these changes. I would argue a little too late, but if they're if they're able to do it, they can still put together a really quality offensive line. You hope Ellen Jenkins can come back and stay healthy. If he does, that helps everything about your offensive line because he is one of the true difference makers for this team. They have to be willing to make this move. And if they do, this offense can keep making the steps that we talked about at the top of the show. There's offensive line issues too. Passing off twists and stunts, it's a big problem for this team. Run blocking assignments, it's the details. They're still problematic. So they're trying to figure it out and you hope that they can. All right, back tomorrow, Expert Tuesday. A lot more to come this week. Is how you doing? Crossover Thursday, interview on Friday, and then we're back Monday night. After the game, we'll have a Monday show, but then we'll have a Monday night show that will be your Tuesday show. Let's not get ahead of ourselves after the Monday night game. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked on Packers. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked on Packers. And anytime you want to come hang out with us live on our YouTube page, you can do that to stay Locked on Packers.